Nobody would enjoy getting sued, right? Nowadays, for any designer, copyright litigations are a very real and serious risk. Legal disputes are indisputably expensive, so there is a perception, and rightly so, that it is difficult for a David to fight a Goliath. Guys, my name is Eric Kodixdorfer and uh, I uh, started this channel wanting to share with you what I've learned during my career in uh, advertising, branding and graphic design, what I call brain communication. The internet has uh, been a true revolution and revolutionized nearly everything, everywhere. There is one thing, though, that has difficulties catching up with uh, the new technology, and that's copyright laws. An attempt was made last time in 1998 with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. That was in the US. That was in 1998, like I said, 23 years ago. Since then, nothing else has been done. And those changes made to the copyright law then were inadequate already. 23 years later, the internet has grown leaps and bounds, has changed a lot and revolutionized even more field than before. But the law hasn't changed. The law is even worse adapted nowadays. And because of this um, slow evolution of the law, there is many, many, many cases of copyright litigations that just completely absurd and don't make any sense with today's media namely social media like YouTube. YouTube content is highly risky nowadays and uh, the copyright law hasn't caught up, like I said, to uh, the realities. And because the text of the law is so vague and difficult to adapt to real today case, it's really open to interpretation, really. And since it's open to interpretation, it's at the end of personal judgment of a lawyer. And lawyers, as we know, they are not exactly very well informed or artistically minded. So how can they be the judge of art and creativity? So because of this uh, status quo, designers are left more or less on their own to make a judgment call um, and sometimes misinformed uh, judgment call. It's very difficult because designers are not lawyers. Law is a very complex topic. And for a designer to try to uh, sort what they can do and cannot do is uh, nearly impossible and tricky and risky. It's even difficult for a lawyer to sort out within the text of the law whether somebody is right or wrong. So the real question of this episode is, is the copyright law or any kind of um, regulation really, is it stifling creativity? And because of this uncertainty uh, for designers to know what to do with copyright laws, well, it's better to play it safe. And uh, therefore, there is a real danger for designers to play down their creativity, uh, just play it safe. And we know that uh, creativity in any society is the engine of innovation and progress. Without creativity, and look at uh, the industrial revolution, without creativity, without thinking outside of the box, you would not get innovation, no innovation, no progress, no progress, doomed to fail. So let's go through some uh, real case uh, to illustrate the conflict that uh, we can find often with the copyright law and between copyright law and artists. So one of those interesting cases was the uh, Barack Obama Hope poster designed by a street artist, Shepard Ferry. Okay, I love this poster. Uh, I think it's super powerful and uh, showed how powerful graphic design can be. Because when that poster came out, Barack Obama was just a candidate for the 2008 presidential and he was not really special. He did not have a favorite position there. He was really struggling. But definitely after that poster started to consider him for their, to be worthy of their vote. I love that poster because it shows how good, great design uh, can influence people and uh, motivate people. And it shows the power of design. So this poster, as we all know, became very famous, uh, again, because it's a great design. 
fame attracts money. Money attracts a lot of attention and sometimes unwanted attention. And somebody noticed that these posters, this poster, this illustration uh, for the Hope poster was taken based on a real photograph from the Associated Press, a freelance photographer took that photo. So Associated Press soon sued Shepard Ferry for breach of copyright. And guess what? They won. So you see, when I personally, again, I'm not a lawyer, but when I look at those two photos or uh, uh, illustration on one side of the Barack Obama poster, Hope poster, and the Associated Press photograph, there is no doubt, of course, that the illustration was based on the actual Associated Press pic. Fair enough. But when you look at the result and what Shepard Ferret did from the original illustration, I think it's far enough removed from the original photo to become something on its own. Artistically, it stands on its own. And since it stands on its own, uh, on its own merit, it exists on its own as a separate entity from where it came from. And you know, I can compare it to a, a chef cooking an award-winning dish in a five-star or three star Michelin restaurant, for example, a chef will sell his prized dish very expensively, expensively, right? But he used ingredients coming from somebody who grows potatoes in a way or veggies in a way that are very tasty and beautiful. That is a very important ingredient of the final dish to make it tasty and beautiful. So the potato is just being an ingredient to the final dish. That photograph from the Associated Press was just an ingredient to form the final illustration. And it's so transformed, just like the potato was transformed by the chef to become this beautiful dish. That original photography was so transformed and modified that, again, it became something different, in my view, anyway. But because, again, I'm, like I said earlier, the copyright law is so vague and open to interpretation, the judge and a court decided that uh, Associated Press should be compensated and Shepard Ferry lost the court case. I think it's very sad. But you see, it doesn't always work in the favor of the plaintiff. Uh, another case, another designer, uh, Jeff Koons, uh, used an original photograph and made a sculpture out of that photograph. Again, the original photographer sued the artist for a breach of copyright. And uh, then, rightfully, uh, the artist got lost the case because the sculpture was way too close, and I agree with the court here, that the artwork, the final artwork, was way too close from uh, the picture, the photograph that it was based upon. So yes, in that case, that was the right decision. So, Another third example was the Cariou versus Prince uh, decision, which uh, is again uh, another photograph from a photographer, a professional photographer, that was uh, transformed by uh, an artist. Uh, again, uh, claiming fair use, which is a, a part of the copyright law where you can legally use something else and transform it and it becomes your own and you have the own copyright, your own copyright on that new transformed artwork. So that's a fair use, but dig into it because it's very murky as well. So he claimed fair use for using the original photograph from that photographer. And he claimed that he transformed it enough to become something uh, completely different, just like Shepard Ferry. So the court first ruled that the changes were not significant enough uh, for prints to justify fair use and uh, that there was a breach of copyright from the original photograph. But the, the decision was appealed and then the court changed completely their mind and decided that Prince was right and uh, suddenly the artwork was changed significantly to become something else that can exist on its own, completely cut off from the source uh, artwork uh, that uh, inspired it. Inspired it. And uh, I think that's a very weird decision, and I did not agree with that one. So again, it shows that uh, if I personally use my common sense and good judgment, I can agree with some court decision, I can see where it comes from and how right it is, 
and I can completely disagree with some other decisions. And that's where my problem and the problem lies is uh, to see how right those decisions based on the text of the law at the moment, at the stage where the copyright law is at, uh, how we, one can question uh, the validity of those decisions. But we are not just talking about designers, graphic designers or artists, visual artists, musicians, for example, John Williams, very famous for um, the Jaws movie uh, score, or Star Wars. Star Wars, for example, the score and some of the most memorable piece of music in that movie or trilogy or whatever, was inspired nearly note for note. Some bits are note for notes from another musician a century earlier uh, called Gustav Holtz. And uh, that was his piece called The Planets. And you can play both, it's on YouTube everywhere. It's very obvious that uh, he got very heavily inspired by Gustav Holtz. But he's not alone. There is a lot of plagiarism, copy, borrowing going into the music industry, and especially in a, in a, to be fair to John Williams, in the movie industry, it was, uh, especially uh, after the Second World War, it was quite common and quite accepted to uh, get influenced with uh, classical work and repertoire to compose your own score for a movie. It was not a big deal. And it was even sometimes requested to, by the, the director for the musician to compose a score that was inspired by Wagner or this or that and with more romanticism and more this and bits of this and bits of that. So to be fair to John Williams, that was kind of normal to do that and borrow bits and bits in there. But he's never been sued. His copyright infringement has never been challenged. Again, inconsistencies here. How can um, the spotlights be so put onto uh, um, artists and designers and some other area is completely gone? Nobody's interested. So I don't understand. <laughs> Laura Leicester in 2012 rightly remarked, today's antiquated copyright law promotes the suppression rather than the promotion of modern culture and 21st century creativity. Understanding one's legal rights in today's digital world is nearly impossible when those rights are encased in outdated laws that are hardly applicable to the new culture of the YouTube revolution. Okay, we saw some visual artists, we saw the case of some musicians and music scoring, what about fashion? There is an incredible case of copyright breach. The Gigi added case. Okay, listen to this. This is crazy. Gigi Hadid was walking in the streets. A paparazzi, a professional photographer, recognized her, asked her gently and nicely whether he could take a photo of her. Good on him because I mean, they don't even ask. She kindly obliged. She said, yes. Go ahead. She smiled at him. He took the photo and she somehow got a copy of it and posted it on her Instagram account. Get that. She got sued by the paparazzi for using his photo without his authorization. The paparazzi got the photo for free. He asked and she kindly obliged, took the photo for free and have the nerve to sue her for <laughs> copyright infringement. Okay, she's a supermodel. Take a photo of that woman is worth a lot of money. He knew that, of course, that's why he took the photo. He sold it to his own agency. He made money out of it. She kindly gave the opportunity to take a photo of her for free and he's got the nerve to sue her. And guess what? He won. But, of course, she's got a lot of money. She can fight it and she's appealing. So, no. This is, this is baffling me and that's where the lack of good judgment I feel is missing. And, you know, I always say that the law, well, I mean, I'm not a lawyer again, so somebody please correct me in, in the comments. The law, I thought, was meant to guide us. It's not something to be followed blindly. you got to use your good judgment. And I think here, <laughs> the law was just followed blindly and good judgment was completely, cruelly absent. There is another case that illustrates perfectly how uneven those decisions about copyright 
R. And since it's uneven, inconsistent, it's easy to say it's unfair because some get punished and some don't. A case in the 60s, 70s of an artist, very famous artist, very close to big artists like Picasso and uh, Andy Warhol, called Ellen Stuttevant. Her thing was to copy, but hang on, not literal copy, copy by memory. She saw something from Andy Warhol, for example, and she just copied it and made it her own artwork. And she was very famous, and it was in, all in the open. Nobody had a problem with that, including Andy Warhol. They were close friends. So she was using bits and pieces from her artist friends to make her own artwork. And uh, she was very famous, and uh, everybody loved what she did. There was no copyright issue then. Go figure. She declared then, and I quite agree with this quote, what is currently compelling is our pervasive cybernetic mode which plunks copyright into mythology, makes origin a romantic notion, and pushes creativity outside the self. Remake, reuse, reassemble, recombine. That's the way to go. That was Ellen Sturtevant then. And I mean, I embrace that. I think that uh, if you do it using good judgment, repurposing artwork, reuse, being inspired, fashion, for example, music, everything, all arts have been influenced by previous work from others built upon like layers, you know. But there is a fine line, obviously. You don't want a straight copy from another one and claim you created it because that's a ripoff and it's stealing and it's plagiarism. And that's definitely wrong, so there is a clear line there. But between the two, there is a gray area, and that's where we need law. But really, uh, this gray area will call on artistic judgment. And uh, I don't think that the lawyers are qualified to express their artistic sensibility. They should stick to the law, and the text of the law cannot be the arbitrary of something from artistic judgment when it's required, you know. So um, there is an issue there. If you want a tip for not getting sued, press the like button right now, or even subscribe, why not? Subscribe, press the bell to get notification when I post new content. And uh, if you do so and subscribe, it will uh, tell YouTube that uh, people like my content, and it will put me up in the ranking, and I will be found more often when people do searches which will help my video and my content to be seen by more. So thank you. So you see in the 60s, 70s, in the case of uh, Ellen Sturtevant, it was completely accepted to plunk things away from others and recombine, like she says. Same for John Williams, it was completely okay and it's still okay today to have bits and pieces from other composers. Okay, one might argue, oh yeah, but they are dead, those composers, so you can pinch it. Well. So is Andy Warhol, but if I do copy of Andy Warhol and I try to claim it's mine, I'm sure I'll be in big trouble. You see, sadly, post 9-11, our society has become less permissive and more repressive. From the DMCA, the Digital Millennium uh, Copyright Act, so 75 million in a month of takedowns, which is an order to take something down because uh, there is a copyright breach just from Google alone. So pff, something like YouTube brings a lot of issues and fair enough for the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. They just cannot cope. There's not enough manpower to personally handle every single case. So they rely on an algorithm and a computer to make the decision. And uh, of course, very often the decision is uh, arguably uh, or demonstrably wrong. But you know, it's not always about copyright. It's about uh, regulation, government regulation, or any kind of regulation that uh, can stifle creativity. Here in Australia, we've got the ABAC, which is the um, Alcohol and Beverage uh, uh, Advertising Code, and that regulates the marketing of and the, the, the marketing of alcohol. Uh, and that's fair enough. No, you do not want alcohol to be willy-nilly distributed to anyone, especially underage. And, uh, but you see, as all regulation and all text of law, it can be abused and misinterpreted. And uh, pff, 
overstepped and going too far, therefore killing creativity. And we do have a bit of that case here in Australia where um, the stipulation recommendations are for designers to not use anything that can be too appealing to the youth market because being appealing, like cool designs, will make, apparently, will make kids drink more. I don't believe it. I think it's stupid. Uh, but, you know, a cool label will not make a kid drink more alcohol. A cool label um, to drink more, there is more societal issues than just because it's cool, uh, because they have a cooler label. Um, binge drinking is, uh, you know, for underage or for young kids. Uh, there is a lot of studies on that, and it's all based on to peer pressure and a desire to fit in, which all teenagers feel and uh, experience every day. Uh, but the cool label is never showing up in any studies. So we already have some backlash, either it's from the designers or from whoever that commissioned that designer to, for a nice beer label or spirit or whatever. But some labels are criminally boring. There is absolutely no creativity whatsoever. They, because you've got to understand that the ABAC stipulations are, for example, to have fonts that are not too youth market oriented. So no funky fonts. You've got to understand that uh, they also don't like to see too much colors because it can be associated to fruit juice, soda. Again, too appealing to the youth market. They do not want to see uh, fruits, for example, because it could be confused for a fruit drink. They do not like to see a lot of things that uh, really reduce uh, designer to a lot of don't do this, don't do that. And uh, like I said, there is a backlash at the moment where some designers, uh, some labels are really, really boring. And it shows definitely that, uh, that uh, directly or indirectly, uh, regulation has stifled creativity in that case. Uh, to be fair to the ABAC, they are still pretty flexible. They are not that hard. They I deal with them and are pretty good. So they let a lot of cool label go through. They ask for a few things to change here and there, but they are not too stiff and difficult. Uh, so it's not that bad. But the danger is still there that it can change, you know, um, directions and get harder and harder and restriction the screw to be tighter. So there is a risk. Uh, still okay at the moment, but there is a risk for creativity to be killed.